only one problem is that um my factory is going to the end maybe like just one hour. Well, no, there's a plug there. Yeah, but my line is not long. Yeah, I think it should be okay. Do you have I'm only talking for half an hour. Why do you have a cable? I want cable, oh, so but it's just like an. Just bought Sure. Thirty is like okay. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, good. But still. But anyway, we need we need we need consistency. We need to be this way. Right? So yeah. No, look at this. Not long enough. Most of the future grant funds. Yeah. You yeah. want the additions you take? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This is unpublished. Yeah. They're good. <laughs> what is the way I saw a couple of yours on the Now you know how it is. You actually post the research that I applied to the grants. Okay. Then I pretend I did it during the grants. Yeah, I figured out how to use the lady. Okay, what's the next one? Yeah, see exactly. Yeah, so I'm not going to talk for an hour. No, we're here. <laughs> Good. I did, did, did this talk just the last week in 20 minutes. But I did skip a few things. So maybe, maybe 25 minutes. You know, I'm not fair to give myself a talk for another week. Uh, so, I might as well say, yeah, this work that's not published yet. Right? It seems to be that this web seminar could be just things you're excited about doing. So, just something new, trying out. I'm not an expert on bearings. Just. Uh, Actually, kind of falls. You, yeah, you gave this uh, talk about how you like to do research. You pick something you want to do. You don't read anything about it. Yeah. And then you develop your own way of doing it. <laughs> and then you go read. And then read. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a reverse, so, uh, yeah. it's possibly it's not the most common strategy, but <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> because the, the first thing people tell you to do is uh, literary. Yeah. Which is uh, I, you know, I do a quick check to see if no one solved the problem. I mean, unless you don't know anything. I mean, if your brain is complete, you have to have some it's kind of foundation in that field. Yeah, yeah, but eventually, I mean, you have to have some background in that area, and then you you, you attack a problem and you find out nobody's used to it. Yeah, I'm not sure I have enough background, but anyway. Okay, and you can work also for experimentalists, right? You can have different experimental techniques. And just try it out. No, yeah. Okay, we're already one minute after two, so I'm Don Xu, postdoctor for PR Rico. Today, I'm the chair, and uh, let's welcome Art Gover for the Ultra Sonic Sensory Bearing talk. Good night. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, as I said, it's something I'm just doing new, so I'm just going to give, try to give a light overview. Um, so, I'm probably people in the room, probably people in the room know much more about bearings than I do, and I know very little. So, but I, so just bear with me in my silly introduction, okay? So, that is sort of typical insight. Some wind turbines. This is one with a lot of gearbox things, as we assume. But I know that they're modern designs, and people don't want the gearboxes. But in any case, all over this thing and in lots of machines, you have bearings, obviously. Bearings are, uh, in this case, I'm showing a picture of a roller bearing. They've got these big cylinders, they can have slightly different shapes. And they're there to help make sure it rotates well with minimal energy. Obviously, if you're gaining energy from a rotating movement, as every turbine plants everywhere do he wants to rotate easily and uh, in this case it has to actually stabilize the main bearing actually stabilize quite a lot of force transmitted uh, through the the wind turbine so it has to it has to take loads as well so some of them could be load bearing and they need to rotate smoothly and there have been issues with them the, you can you can have significant costs in replacing these and the, and these kind of bearings do fail rather unpredictably there are some things which fail quite predictably and you don't bother uh, sensing them. You just run them for a couple of years and you know they fail every four years and you replace them a year before and things like this. And roller bearings and other bearings are an example of things which are not like that. They tend to fail rather unpredictably. If they failed and you didn't replace them before, they can lead to other damage um, and you could potentially, if they're really large, repair them before they're damaged. So it's worth sensing them, is what I'm trying to say. They can be big, this picture really close to it to make it look even bigger. Um, yeah, ra radius of one to three meters, that's pretty big, right? So somebody told me that something they're making these things bigger and bigger because they're efficient. So new mechanisms of failure are coming into place, and also the cost of sensing is going down. 
So um, here are some designs that are supposedly going through already. So in 20, this is, these are onshore wind turbines and these are offshore. And uh, so there's supposed to be a design going through in 2035 of one with, uh, what's the radius? I need meters, 250 meter rotor diameter. So they're big, they cost a lot. It's worth putting, putting a little bit of money into sensing this thing. Make sure that it's running as it should do. Uh, for the components that fail, obviously, like the bearings. Um, yeah, things that can go wrong with them. This is an artist's depiction of things that can go wrong. Some big factory crack thing, that's not good. You can uh, wear away due to sort of slightly unbalanced sort of forces. It could be an unbalance in geometry too. You can wear away part of it over time in the waste way. There can be problems with the oil degradation and oil change, you may want to sense. Um, right, what does that say? So um, it's challenging to be, there have been many different kinds of failures which were initially not as expected. And it was challenging to understand what went wrong because we don't measure it. We don't measure really what the forces that's going on inside there. You, you have to take the whole thing apart. I mean, there's vibration measurements and you can kind of estimate what's going on, but there's, no, there's not a really that clear measurement uh, of what's going on inside. Uh, a lot of these, this is now going back some five, six more years ago, but the when they put a new design for these, um, for a bearing and a big wind turbine thing, they go through a, a series of testing to get certified that it all works well. And they've got this process in the US. And they're all passing these processes with flying colors and then failing five years later. So something's not, they were not met. One reason to develop the sensing method is actually to be part of the certification process, you know, thing to check that the design works as intended as well. So there's lots of different reasons you may want to measure the forces being transmitted through these bearings. I did enough literature review to know that people don't do that. A wind blows at it too. It could be waves. Use your imagination. Godzilla may have something wacky. Oh yeah, and then there's geometric de defects like it's not quite circular or it's not quite centered, the axis relation to the other pieces. And this is just for, for roller bearings, but what I'm talking about actually applies to other bearings too. So what do people currently do? After I came up with my own method to solve it, I then looked and said, let's see what people do. And uh, they do a lot. <laughs> they have been doing a lot for a long time. Uh, condition monitoring has been quite, is quite used now in the industry. Basically, it's generally, it's not always, but generally just one sensor, if not very few. And they, uh, they're just measuring the vibrations as, it, as it's rotating. And uh, if you do a Fourier analysis, so you look at the, the different frequencies that are most prominent, you always get some peaks. This makes a lot of sense for a rotating thing because it's kind of rotating roughly at a similar speed. So you've got one frequency, which is uh, how long it takes for one bearing to go from here to the next position along. You've got another frequency of bearings rotating on themselves. And you have harmonics as well of those things. So uh, state of the art of, the in of condition monitoring until very recently, it was a bit like this. You measure this graph, you look at the peaks, you keep measuring it. If one of them changes, you're like, ha ha, the first peak changed. I reckon that's probably something to do with the, the whole thing here, probably the shape of it. And then there's all these rules, it's like uh, 50 rules. If the first one changes and the second one doesn't, then maybe it's a roller. If the second one changes and the third one triples, it could be the oil of it. It's like madness. The number of exceptions and rules, and every single rule is like sort of maybe kind of works for some cases. So it's very uh, it's very empirical, really. There is there is some logic into it about how fast the thing turns that gives you the frequency of different things. But I I was wondering, can we do better than that? What? We've got sensors on this thing already. Can I do better? Can I, what's the most we can get out of these sensors? We're already putting sensors on these things. Why not? We, why don't we do the best we can with that information? I think there's probably more information to be got there. This, this little video is just to show you that there is information. If you measure the vibrations here, it's going to tell you something about what created the vibrations. So here it goes. It's a force of the gravity. A wave comes out from a vibration. You measure it over here. Surely, if you're measuring these here, you can kind of back propagate them and think what what created them right 
Now, I'm doing this in a very mathematical way. I'm not just looking at simulations and picking stuff, but I just want to show you the, the gist of it. So um, this is a slide about the results before I tell you how I did it. I'm not sure that's the right way to do it. So here's an example of the kind of pressure fields you might get from gravity. So gravity pressing into the, the axis in the center here, which I didn't draw for some reason, and uh, being transmitted through the rollers, and red is high pressure and blue is low pressure. There's not just pressure, there are other shearing forces too. But I'm just going to show you pressure, just keep it simple. So if you didn't use much maths or modeling, and you just use this basic idea from condition monitoring about picking the right frequencies, so you're still using some clever stuff here, you're picking the right frequencies, and you were to try to then infer the stresses onto each of these, the forces, this is what you would get. It's actually not completely the most terrible thing I've ever seen, but it's not accurate as well, right? And if you were to start messing about with the forces here, it would start off. If you do a little bit of mathematical modeling about um, how forces actually get transmitted through a small contact point, this is what you would recover with just three sensors. So really nice. So that's a bit of the results. Just, and now, so just to, just to clarify, actually, I'd, I'd love to be interrupted as well. If anyone wants to ask me anything at any time, you have to stop and clarify. So sensors here, they're measuring pressure, but you can think of them as measuring displacement or something. Um, is there anything I've missed in explaining this? Oh, yeah, these, these sensors look like they're on the inside. That's just a graphical mistake. They're on the outside. I just I copied them wrong. You don't put sensors inside the thing, right? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. What kind of sensors are you thinking about? These are just typical transfeeder elements. Like, so it's the measuring strain or acceleration? Well, um, that's an interesting question. So you can infer both those things with different pieces. You just put a little piece of element, you just glue it onto something, right? You can infer it. Yes. So either one, I suppose. And for the purpose of this talk, let's think of it as displacement because it makes it easy to understand. <laughs> Depending how you calibrate your sensors, you can infer uh, it is a good question of sensors. Like if you put a big sensor here, it can start to disturb the field itself. So imagine these as as, as what Rob Joyce's group of sticky little things on that don't disturb the dynamics that much. Okay, happy to be interrupted anymore. Oh, this is just to show you that the the true force transmitted through the bearings was the blue, and what we recovered with those three sensors. In using the right thing is the orange, just to say, yeah, it kind of works for that case at least. All right. So now I'm going to give you a gist of why why it works and what I've been doing for the last year or so on this. Um, how do you, how, why does it work? Okay, so the reason it works is that I'm trying to model, even if I don't know the forces that are transmitted to here, I know how a force, whatever it is, should be transmitted. I'm trying to use the maths insert that as a prior information, to add that as information. I'm trying to suck out all the information that's available and then solve the problem. And that's the general gist of trying to do a bit more action with this. So as an example, your gravity pulling it down the middle, let's keep it really simple. You may, you, you may from some prior study, have a sense of what the, the force uh, looks like when transmitted through a bearing due to gravity. So just to explain this picture a bit more. Um, when the bearing is in contact, that's the blue line showing where the bearing is in contact. So as it moves, the force it experiences moves, and that's the same as if we're moving along this red curve. So you may, for example, for some reason, know what this red curve is, then you would know exactly the force transmitted through the bearings are approximately these forces here as they, and they move in time. Okay? So what did this picture tell us actually? What am I trying to tell you here? Uh, yeah, this is a gist of what if you knew the total gravity force, and you could work out this curve through all sorts of complicated things, and then you'd know exactly the force to there. We don't know that curve in general, but this is just to start explaining it. Um, I'll probably skip the maths bit, I think. So the maths is, uh, yeah, oh no, this is the former problem. So the this, this sensing problem is what we call an inverse problem, they're hard. Uh, and before we start solving the inverse problem, we, we first solve what's called the four problem, the easier version. The easier version is if you knew the forces the bearing transmitted through this thing, if you knew, and you, you can assume it's zero traction on the outside, let's say it's air in contact with something that might be uh, metal will be there, then you can solve this problem. You know the forces they're transmitting, you can solve it, right? That's what the four 
the inverse problem, the one that actually people want to solve, is a bit harder. It's saying, I don't know anything that's going on inside here. I'm only measuring, let's say, the displacement at a few positions, and I also know the outside is generally traction free. So um, before I show you how we got to the final results, let's just start thinking about uh, generally the community of inverse problem, the classical community of things. I just put as many sensors as I can. I make no assumptions much what's inside, and I just see what happens, and I just try to measure things. So let's just try that and show you how that works first. And uh, any questions about anything? Shut me if you wish. Okay, I'm going to flash through one slide of maths. Close your eyes if you want. Um, this is full elasticity, so you need to you take the full displacement vector. You assume that the metal is isotropic. It's pretty accurate for this case. Slight and isotropic is here, don't make much difference. Then you can decompose it into two potentials, which you substitute in equations of motion. The equation of motion can be written into in terms of two Helmholtz equations, which are two separate wave equations for each of the potentials. Phi is known as the pressure. Psi is known as one of the shear waves. We're assuming a symmetry in 2D because it's like cylinders in a cylindrical domain. So because of that, you're going to get one shear mode. Between you get two. You get these two Helmholtz equations. They're quite easy to solve. When you solve them, you can write them in terms of a series of known functions. These are like a Fourier decomposition at times unknown coefficients. So don't worry about the details here. Let me just see which bit of this I would like to explain to you. Um, generally, when we use, um, let's say, a uh, finite element, you might use a general representation for the field, and you substitute it into the equation of motion, and you solve this giant equation, matrix equation for the equation of motion. Whereas in a lot of the uh, mathematical community, what they do is they first solve the equation of motion. And that tells you, you can write it as in a very reduced form. But there are some coefficients you don't know. So the only thing you need to do is solve the boundary conditions. So um, it's, 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 if you have people who've heard of the, the groups physics of form, machine learning, this, you can do, you can use the physics at different levels. You can use part of the boundary condition, you can use part of the equation of motion. In this case, we use all the equations of motion to reduce the solution to maximum effect. That means you're making a lot of assumptions about what's going on there, but it means it's easy to solve. So if you had boundary conditions, you might write them in functions in terms of theta. Theta is the angle as you go around this thing. R is the distance from the center. And you can form some matrix equations that look like maybe saying a finite element. The difference is that this is just a four by four matrix, not a whatever by whatever. And you have to solve for each n, which are the Fourier modes, and they're independent. If you didn't understand that, it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to use that much now. I'm just going to talk about more conceptual because you know I'm sure people here are not that interested in maths details. So if you do that with the forward problem where you specify the traction inside and the traction outside, you will create this quite e very easy to solve matrix equation which only relates the boundary data. And these two, this is known from the physics, and this is what you want to measure. And you can do the same for the inverse problem, but you get a different matrix. So you could say, I only know what's on the outside, I know what's on the inside. So you do all this math to make these simpler systems, right? But you could have just used finite element, right? Or some other software. So why bother with this? Why not just use finite element? I've written the conclusion there. Ah, they come together. Why not? All right. Why not? Is anyone else thinking, why not use finite element? Well, audience interaction here. Everybody would. would you just use finite element? Why bother with all the maths? It's hard, right? The maths. Why bother? You've got software to do it for you. I don't like time and element. That's just personal, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a matter of principle for me. I think the inverse problem is hard to do. You can solve all the problems that you can solve the inverse. That's very true. Yeah. So that's one one very normal that's a normal feature is that you can solve quite complicated uh, forward problems, but the inverse problem. It's, if you just ask finite element to solve this, it just gives you nonsense to begin with, right? It could do. So I, I'm going to explain it like this. First, I'm going to mention the positives of finite element. I don't want to give an unbiased view here. The positives are is that if you wanted to change geometry, you want to attach something on here, want uh, some layers, you want other things, you can do that in finite elements. You're not going to fundamentally change your whole methodology, are you? You're going to make the model a bit more complicated, and you're going to run it again with that. So finite element, good for that. Second thing that's good for that, you don't need to be an expert all the maths to make it work. 
But uh, things that don't work well is that when it doesn't work, it doesn't tell you why. You, you may you may say, I've just got too few sensors. Uh, am I getting the right type of information? Am I putting them in the right place, the sensors? Am I measuring the right frequencies? Is this problem even possible? If you ask Planet Element to solve this, it will give you something. But the maths may say, actually, it's not possible. You needed another sensor, just one. The maths tells you why it's not working. It says there's something wrong with the angular resolution. It says this is too thin or this is too fat. Or it, it tells you what could work. It will tell us when is this problem possible? What can we measure? What can we not measure, no matter what you do? And uh, where are the best places to put the sensors? That's a good reason to do these kind of models. Even if it doesn't translate directly to the real case, it tells you what you can do. In this case, I think there is a way actually to translate it as well for making the good measurements. All right, so this is before I get into the, this is the forward problem, showing a video of the forward problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are you setting like a profile without the interface? You're setting a certain profile on that. Which interface, the outer or the inner? Uh, well, outer is attraction field, as you said. The yeah. inner one in contact with your. Walls. Yeah. Is it like a, so you're setting a, a profile, like a continuous function or something? Yeah, yeah. The, in this case, we're setting uh, exactly a continuous profile which the bearings will traverse. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the force they transmit is not continuous because they're the moving. Problem, you don't, you don't know that function. For the forward problem, yes. You assume you know where all the forces, then you can solve everything. But the one that we actually want to solve is this one. And essentially, your M contains integrals. No integrals, actually, just special functions. So you can resolve your boundary conditions exactly. So you can resolve the... The analytic solution would look pretty yeah. ugly, but numerically extremely easy. Yeah, but do you... Uh, is this when you resolve the boundary conditions... Solve this equation. So you, you use the orthogonality or something. Oh, you've already used it before this to take in the Fourier mode. So if you use that the Fourier modes are orthogonal, and this is already just writing what orthogonal components relate to what orthogonal components. That's what makes it so easy to solve this resulting system. You've already used all orthogonality, all symmetries, and all physics. Uh, sorry, I have a question. It's like we're talking about sensoring. It's uh, just a one single point. So yeah, it's just a single. Let's, to, to keep it simple, let's assume that you only have a measurement angle. One point here, mm -hmm. one point here, one point here. You have nothing there. You don't There's know. Not a two dimensional, so you don't know which direction the wave propagates to. You just know that. You just, this is just a, like a like a little pressure sensor. When pressure is near here, it goes pressure. It just registers the increasing voltage. It knows nothing about where things come from or anything like that. Okay. It's just okay. imitating how you would put a piezo. It just lights up and pressure comes through. It's very dumb. Okay, so just a little example of a forward problem. I made a little crack burst in time just to see the waves go around because it's pretty. And uh, I, just to show you in, in operation. So I've done, I've added attenuation. Metal doesn't attenuate this much actually, but I've added attenuation because it makes the video look nicer. Show you. Okay. So the question is now if we put sensors on the outside, Let's say, what can we can we infer where that came from, for example? So um, this is kind of like how almost find an element would work now, actually, I suppose. Uh, all I've done here is I've just formulated the boundary conditions with some displacement here and here. And I've said zero traction on the outside. And I just asked it, where does the field concentrate in the middle? Solve the problem and asked it where the field concentrates. This is a really dumb way to do this. This is not the best way to do it at all. But uh, this is actually a classical way of kind of finding concentration of the field. So you see it works reasonably well for three sensors, okay, for five and whatever, four, and the high sensors in the last one. You've got something saying there, don't I? Um, so this is actually just directly solving the inverse problem using nothing about what's going on inside. All I do is I take the measurements on the outside, formulate those equations, which make, make no assumptions about what's going inside. It knows nothing about what's inside. It doesn't even know there's a there's a, a wall here. It doesn't know what created it. it. Doesn't know anything. That's why I drew the frog. Um, I drew the frog because if the frog made the noise like rivet, whatever, it would still find where the noise came from because it knows nothing of what's going on inside. In this basic method I showed you the setup of. So actually, it doesn't work that well. Um, 
for example, if I was to try it on this field here, so it kind of works for the, so I just, uh, yeah, let me just say a little comment about this, is that this is the most basic approach to it, but we are now solving this problem in a mathematical way, which says, what's the best possible algorithm? There are lots of algorithms people use, even in the next group they do it, in other groups they use sorts of arrival times and they map them back, but now because we've got a mathematical formulation of this, we can ask, what is the ideal algorithm, not just here's one. But I'm not going to show you anything about that now. I'm just showing you that this is the direct solution of that. You could even do that in finite element if you were really clever with finite element. You have to be very clever about your elements. Get that not to give you nonsense in finite element. So if I was to try that approach on this, it's not going to work. If I put three sensors, you only get as much resolution as you have number of sensors. The resolution here, the distancing of the resolution you need to resolve this is so much smaller than the distance between the sensors, you get nothing. It doesn't work at all. So that's what you would get if you looked at finite element two as well. It wouldn't give you anything. Three sensors can only measure three coefficients. Three coefficients only gives you the, the resolution of cosine sine is nothing. You're actually only looking at noise amplifier. It's not even anything there. So the, the, the way that you get the maths to work for you harder is that you say, I want to use all the information there. I know that they're in contact with some bearings. I know how fast the bearings are traveling around. Can I use that to help solve the inverse problem? Of course, you can. There's always a way to use information. So just to uh, conclude about using that inverse problem, that is actually a version of what's called classical tomography, where you put absolutely tons of sensors. You make no assumptions of what's going on inside, and then you solve the problem. It does work if you have loads of sensors you know, CT scans and other things and, and whatever, ultrasonic imaging. You can do it, but you need so many sensors. And uh, as we know from quite expensive, you know, you try to do a scan, CT scan, it's expensive. The equipment's super expensive. We're not building this stuff for engineering components everywhere because it would be more expensive than most of the components. So it's not a popular approach, obviously. So you need to use more information about the problem. You cannot solve it blindly just by saying, put loads of sensors and solve the uh, four year modes or we'll solve the finite element modes, if you will. Any questions? No. Why, why is it so fake on that? Uh, I guess it was supposed to say conclusion, it doesn't work. But it was supposed to be like, an, a, like a trick conclusion, but I've not really solved it very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I had some maps about how we include the right information, but I'm a bit nervous about going through maps. So I'll try and just explain the idea of it. Let's say if you knew, I'm going to explain the idea in the most basic example possible. It's just an example, it's not the general method, okay? Because the general method is full of maps. The basic example is what if you knew the shape? Of the profile. Let's say if it was due to gravity, you would know something about the shape of this profile, but you might not know the amplitude. You might not know the exact amount of gravity being transmitted at any time, but you might know something about the shape due to symmetry or something. Let's assume you do. If you knew exactly what this function was, the red function, you could sub you could uh, substitute it in some operator which will give you the boundary conditions. And if you have the boundary conditions, you have everything, you solve the problem. But you don't know this function, right? You don't know. That's what we want to find out. What if you didn't know what it was, but you knew that the shape of it, so the thing we didn't know about it was its amplitude. You don't know what to multiply it with. So you know the shape, but you don't know its amplitude. Can you use just can you use that knowledge? How do you use that knowledge? So what you do is you substitute this again into boundary conditions. Because these are a linear waves, it's going to be a linear operator. X is going to come on the outside of this thing. So you're going to have the boundary data, the thing you actually need, is going to be a thing you know, which is a big vector, times a number you don't know. Still can't solve it, right? It's not a boundary condition. If, you're, if there's a number that you don't know. And here comes the trick. This is when you're using the four problem instead of the inverse problem. OK, so the thing you don't know, but you do know the shape of the force. What you do is you just substitute this in the four problem. And you can't solve for A, but you can rewrite A like this. So you rewrite A in terms of things you don't know times a number, times things you do know, matrices and vectors, times a number you don't know. So this is like uh, using priors or dimensional reduction. You still don't know A. A is knowing everything. A is knowing everything in the field. You still don't know it. But you now 
have a representation of it that involves only one unknown number. If you do the statistical Bayesian way, you could do this far more sophisticated way, but then it would look more you know, harder for me to explain. So once you've done a reduction and you can write A in terms of just some one number you don't know, you can just substitute in the inverse problem. And then you would only need one sensor to measure it. If you have one unknown, the X comes into here, comes on the outside, you can take the, you can solve this whole thing, pseudo inverse, and uh, you would have a solution. And if you look at this, and of course you're not gonna look at this, but just believe me, one unknown, you would only need one sensor there. So that's the, that's the gist of it. You can make that far more sophisticated, but that's the idea. You can use the forward problem to reduce the dimension of the solution space and then substitute the inverse problem. So I'm sorry if that was too much maths, I'll just give you the gist that the way that I'm actually solving this is I don't make an assumption about the amplitude of this thing. All I do is you make an assumption that it's smooth. You can make an assumption that it's smooth or it has a localized defect. That in itself is powerful enough that with three sensors, you could solve the problem almost exactly for a range of cases. And so that's the gist of it, really. I don't think I've got a fine talk for half an hour. I did. Yes, I did say I wouldn't talk for more than half an hour. And I've finished. So uh, that's the idea of it. I do a bit more mass modeling than most people in the department, and I'm trying to tell you why that can be useful in some cases to really extract all the information you've got of the problem to solve it. And we're taking this forward now into making it more sophisticated. And I don't just do pressure waves, I do shear waves too. So we can determine how much the bearings are frictioning and all sorts of things going on there. And uh, yeah, looking to make that all more robust and get some funding. That finished my talk. <laughs> it's like very detailed, but at the same time, lots of equations. <laughs> <laughs> Details and lots of equations, my favorite. <laughs> okay, uh, any questions? Did have to have questions. Uh, M forward, I understood. M inverse, where did you get that from? That's the, um, the M forward was, uh, you know what's in here, and you have an assumption zero fraction there. And if you um, just turn to the equations of motions, and how uh, do I say that, and uh, use this symmetry and everything to solve it, you get M forward. M inverse, because you put the boundary conditions only here, the relationship between the fundamental modes and the data changes. That relationship is matrix M inverse. The M forward, it's the fundamental modes related to boundaries in and out. M inverse, fundamental modes related to boundaries on the out. Yes, so when you actually have to, when you actually coded this, what did you, what, what, what were you doing? When I coded this, I just, that simple matrix equation. Uh, what went into it? Oh, what goes into the matrix equation? Oh, yes, into M in, or is Special, it so um, it, because it's uh, waves in a cylindrical domain, you could write them in terms of best one for the accomplished modes. So what ends up going into this is just some known matrix, generally a four by four that changes the index with special functions. And that's it, it's, it's a small, known thing. Small matrix. The small matrix in terms of special functions. And the special functions bit, if you're in an applied maths community in, in 20 years ago, all the talks would be on and on about special functions. It would bore you to hell. But basically, it makes a very large problem in finite element into a very small problem in maths. But then the work is done by the special functions and the symmetry involved. And uh, all, all the libraries you use in Python, MATLAB, they have them all coded to work super fast. In this case, it's Bessel and Hankel. Functions, if you like those. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> uh, I've got questions. Like, um, so basically, you're using special function, yeah? Yeah. It's like uh, you're talking about Bessel function. As I know, it's like this works for, to some extent, it's working like a, a module equation. Let's see our simple equations. But some cases, in reality, it could be very complicated. Yeah. The wave just like a propagation. Every direction. Yeah. So I wonder if your method works for very complicated practical things. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, let's have a picture of the bearing. So uh, this 
this method assumes that this is perfectly cylindrical. If it's slightly, it's funny because I said I want to measure if it's off cylinder, off cylindrical, not perfectly cylindrical. And then I made it cylindrical in the mass. But actually, you can still measure it if it's off cylindrical because and that's a bit difficult to explain. But when you make a slight distortion in this, you have a huge forces appear. The time it takes for waves to travel around, bounce around, doesn't really change at all. So in that case, it still works. Anyway, so what I've assumed is that it's perfectly circular, it's a cylinder, and there's nothing attached to it. And you can make waves leak through the, the oil a little bit. Okay, so in other words, in other words, it's like you mean that, okay, it's slightly can be, you know, it's slightly changed the shape, but still you need a uh, like cylinder, yeah? Yeah, so for example, you always attach things here, right? You have to All attach right. this component to another component. Okay. There will be attachments here, and that doesn't fit perfectly the representation of vessels and handles. Okay. So yeah. uh, as you start to make the geometry more complicated, the mass starts to quickly get much more complicated as well. Yeah. So uh, the question is, we don't know how well this works exactly with attachments. We can put attachments in the mass, but it makes it a bit harder. So there's two, two reasons to do it. One is just to know what's possible and not possible. How many sensors do you know? Even if this doesn't this model isn't an exact representation of an experiment, it does guide you very detailed on what to do, what to measure, and what can be measured. But I think actually it probably will work quite well because even if you have attachments, they don't tend to be, you can, if you press something on here, if it's got a slight sort of gap or whatever, or it's not gonna, it's still gonna reflect most of the waves. You could do an impedance condition, which is like that. If you do small attachments, you can add that in the mass, but generally waves don't, they don't tend to lose too much energy. You're gonna get what, a couple of, a few percent error. So but the question is, I don't know for now. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's like, yeah. Think about this fact from just change slightly, back a little bit, and then a huge damage. So if before it's a huge damage, your method works. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah. So we would pick up on any disturbance in the forces here. If a crack makes a noise, there's two kinds of methods. There's emission, and then there's, there's vibration from uh, geometrical defects here. So yeah, you were, just, you were trying to pick, basically that's it. Yeah, we're trying to use, pick up on, the beginnings of things, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Is, it, is there any benefit with this method of having more than three sensors? Oh, yeah, yeah. of course, yeah. So, it, it, so this is, I've, what I've presented to you as a general framework, and uh, when you actually go to apply that, it depends on what you're applying it to, the cost of that thing, where you can put the sensors. And I love the general framework. I'm a very general framework person, because then if we go and they say, oh, look, we, we're not going to put sensors all over this thing, it's huge. We've got access to this patch. But I'll put I'll put ten there. Can you? Does it still work? And we could find out quite quickly. We'll very quickly say you can get this, this, and that, or no, you cannot get the thing you want. Um, so yeah, I haven't presented to you at all what the ideal number of sensors depends on the cost benefits, what you want to measure, have a bearing. I've just shown you sort of toy examples. You got you got one crack in the in a race of the bearing. Yeah. What happens if there's multiple cracks? Would you be able to find them, or is there a case where they could cancel each other out and they wouldn't yeah, see them? That's a great question. That's one of the reasons I like this. So, in a lot of the methods that develop, let's say, it depends if you're talking about acoustic emission, if you're talking about they're just as the bearings pass over, they press the cracks, they're kind of different. But acoustic emission, for example, most methods assume to work that there's only one crack. Because they they look they're mapping arrival times, they need to know exact arrival time, and they're mapping them back in time. Basically, there's uh, like um, what do you call it? The dead reckoning or whatever GPS or these things. You know, you're just looking how far it But if you don't know how many things are emitting signals, you actually cannot infer things. So most traditional methods do not work in those cases. The method I'm presenting so far made no assumptions about anything at all. Could have been anything. So it, there's a question about resolution, but it works robustly in those cases. Now it's a little bit different in acoustic emission to I've got a rough uh, a crack that's making it rough here, now the crack there, that's, but it works in both of those things. There's a little bit of issue that the this final method here that I showed you, we're still working on refining this. This assumes that there's a smooth transmission of forces as the bearing moves. So if the bearing was here and it's now over here, the difference between the force transmitted is only a little bit. 
So you can have cases that that doesn't fit that assumption. So this particular method that works beautifully here wouldn't work in that case. We need an adaptive method. I don't know if that answered your question. So yeah, maybe I've talked too long. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know. Um, have you looked at any sort of percent replacement as well as the number of percentages? In a, in a situation like this, then you know, we've got higher um, amplitude forces down at the bottom of there. Right? Yeah, so, makes sense. You want to put them down there? Yeah, right? yeah. You know, haven't even begun looking at sensor placement. Because first I'm trying to understand what is the best thing to refine to, like what is the thing that people most want measured. So now I'm yeah. trying to just gain, just convince companies and people in order to see this. I've got enough to say there's something here. Now I want to, when people say, all right, I really want to measure this, then I'll think about that question. <laughs> I think I've already done a year of work with no funding just to get enough evidence to say, would you like to use this thing? So I don't want to do five years of work and then turn around and somebody say, like, actually, I don't want to use it anyway. Okay, I don't want to take anyone's more time. I think everyone should be free to go. If anyone wants to talk to me a little bit more, I'll just stand here awkwardly. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so let's <laughs> forty minutes now. Thanks, guys. Channel one. Channel one.